This is Dateline News and Conversation. The topic tonight, Iran's massive missile strikes on Israel. My guest, Dimitri Laskaris. Dimitri, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me, Regis. Always a pleasure. Well, the pleasure is always mine. Um, boy, I didn't see that coming. April 14th, I went to bed the night before. All calm. I wake up in the morning and, oh, my God, the headlines. Um, I want to talk to you about that strike. Um, first of all, tell me what you know about the effectiveness of that strike. Then we'll talk about the strategy, what was accomplished, etc. So what do we know as of today, two days later, about that strike? What we can say with uh, perhaps not complete confidence, but with a reasonably high level of confidence, is that uh, Iran launched about three waves of projectiles at uh, Israel, uh, commencing uh, late, I believe it was Saturday night, going into Sunday morning, uh, Athens time. And uh, it appears that the Americans and therefore the Israelis were given uh, advance notice of the attack. Uh, certainly they knew hours before any projectiles reached uh, Israeli airspace, because whether or not the uh, the Iran Iranians told the Americans that the attack was coming, uh, the IDF, the Israeli military, and the American government themselves announced that a drone attack had been launched hours before they arrived in Israeli airspace. Then um, uh, it appears very much that uh, many of these drones, which were relatively slow moving, and I understand they were the lower quality drones in Iran's possession, were struck by uh, Israeli military, I'm sorry, American military forces in West Asia, and uh, uh, also British and French, uh, apparently from naval vessels, also land-based air defense systems uh, of, at US bases between, line between Israel and uh and iran uh and then um there was a second wave which consisted of uh largely cruise missiles um and uh that was followed by ballistic missiles the total number of projectiles according to uh israel itself was in the range of 350 and about 170 of the projectiles were drones which were relatively easy to shoot down um it appears that the vast majority of the drones were destroyed, perhaps even all of them, before they actually struck any targets within Israel itself. And a large number of them were destroyed uh, before they even reached Israeli airspace. Um, as to whether any of the cruise missiles got through the air defense systems, uh, that's unclear at this stage. Uh, and you know, let me just say at the outset that the Israeli government and military have absolutely no credibility. None, nor does the United States government for that matter. So whatever they're claiming uh, should be taken with a very large grain of salt. Uh, but they're, especially when they're being so secretive about the actual impacts, you know, allowing people to inspect areas without restriction that were potentially struck or targeted by Iran. So we don't know what really happened with those cruise missiles. It is absolutely clear that some of the ballistic missiles uh, struck uh, their targets, one of which was the Nevatim Air Base uh, in southern Israel, which is about 1,100 kilometers away from the western border of Iran. Um, the Iranians claim that they also struck another air base, and there's, there were video indications that this is the case, it's the Ramon Air Base, which is about 1,300 kilometers from Iran and is in the Negev Desert. Uh, and here, uh, then there's a question as to whether a third site was, was struck, and it's called Meron, uh, which is in an elevated uh, a plateau in the Syrian Golan Heights, which Israel illegally occupies and has illegally annexed. And this is, this is essentially a military intelligence base uh, that Israel uses in part to uh, uh, 
surveil uh, activities in Syria, of the Syrian military and Iranian forces in Syria. So those were the three sites that the Iranians say they targeted. Uh, I, I believe there's reasonably good evidence that all three were actually struck, uh, at least by ballistic missiles, possibly by uh, uh, cruise missiles, and even maybe by some drones. Uh, I think the claim of the Israeli, and this is what the Israelis are claiming, uh, that 99% of the projectiles were shot down is complete nonsense. Uh, I don't think there's any air defense system that is capable of shooting down that many projectiles, including ballistic missiles and cruise missiles, with that level of proficiency. Um, but is it possible that the majority of the projectiles were, were shot down? Uh, absolutely, P particularly because the majority of them were slow-moving drones, which I think were sent by the Iranians to uh, both exhaust Israel's air defense systems and also to discover uh, the location of those air defense systems, the radars and the batteries uh, and so forth, and also to confuse them. Uh, but 99%, no, I, I think that's preposterous, uh, and there's absolutely no reason to, to uh, give the Israeli military the benefit of the doubt. So from a purely military perspective, I think that's what was accomplished. I don't, I don't think we can say at this stage whether any of these three military targets, uh, the Nevatim Air Base, the Ramon Air Base, or the, uh, uh, the uh, Meron Air Base was uh, greatly damaged, uh, or even whether any of them was actually destroyed and rendered unusable. Um, but... Uh, uh, I, I don't think that the it was necessary for Iran to do that, to destroy any of those military targets for it to achieve its objectives. Uh, to I think it's quite obvious what its objectives were. Its objectives, first of all, were to uh, determine the uh, sophistication and the and, and acquire operational information about Israel's air defense systems. Uh, number two, to cause Israel to expend enormous amounts of air defense missiles. And uh, thirdly, to send a message that it had the capacity to strike the most heavily defended, from an air defense perspective, military assets that Israel has, uh, basically at a time and place of its choosing. And um, if, if those were its objectives, and I think that uh, we can assume from everything that's been said and done that, that those were likely the objectives, I think that this was a great success from a military perspective. Uh, whatever the West may be saying. Okay. Um, let me ask you a couple of questions. Uh, for clarify this, do you think Iran, God, do you think Iran uh, learned something from Russia's experience in the Ukraine? When they fly in multiple decoy drones, really cheap, to overwhelm whatever was left in Ukraine's missile defense systems, and then come in with heavier missiles uh, like cruise missiles or even their hypersonic missiles. Uh, do you think that Iran learned from that? And the second part of the question is, uh, it's been reported that Iran used their hypersonic missiles and all of them got through. What are your thoughts on both of those? Uh, well, interestingly, when the uh, drones were launched and the press uh, cited American officials and Israeli officials as stating that uh, a wave of drones was coming, that was initially what the reports were. There was nothing said about cruise missiles or ballistic missiles. Uh, I received an email from a Palestinian friend of mine who's been following the Ukraine war a lot less closely than I have been. And he uh, questioned what the Iranians were up to. And he said, why would they only send drones? Um, you know, does he act, do they actually believe that they're going to be able to cause significant damage given the extent and nature of the air defenses that Israel has uh, with a wave of drones? And I said to him exactly this, uh, I've seen this over and over again in the Ukraine war. So don't assume that this is the end of the uh, the missile attack. This may well be a beginning. And what we may next see are 
cruise missiles and ballistic missiles and possibly also hypersonic missiles. And they're going to be sent in waves with the least sophisticated and most numerous projectiles launched first uh, to confuse and exhaust and uh, uh, reveal information about Israel's air defenses. And literally within uh, minutes of my sending my email to my friend saying this, a report came out that uh, Iran had launched uh, cruise missiles. And then we got a report that there were ballistic missiles on the way to Israel. So, of course, we don't know exactly what communications have gone on uh, between uh, the Iranians and the Russians. What we do know is that they cooperate very extensively militarily, not just in terms of sharing expertise and uh, technology, but there have been reports that uh, they're selling, you know, military equipment to each other. Um, uh, and uh, the Russians have a strong interest in ensuring that Iran... I don't think it's looking for any kind of a conflict with Israel, but it has a strong interest in ensuring that Iran uh, is well defended and is not destroyed by the United States or any of its proxies in the region. And uh, it has a strong motivation, frankly, uh, to uh, exact vengeance upon the United States because the United States for two years, more than two years now, has been using its Ukrainian proxy in order to inflict maximum damage on the Russian Federation. So it would be very surprising to me if the Russians and uh, the Iranians had not consulted extensively over the past two years about the most effective means to wage missile warfare against NATO or its proxies. I think it's highly likely that that has happened. And even if it hasn't actually been formal cooperation, I think the Iranians and frankly, every major military around the world, particularly those that have missile capacity, have been very, paying very close attention to what the Russians are doing. And at this stage, uh, given that the Russians have been waging war every day for over two years against a heavily armed NATO proxy, which has had every manner of sophisticated air defense systems available to the United States given to it. I mean, you know, there have been NASAMs and man pads and Iris T systems, and of course the Patriot systems, all of these have been given in abundance to Ukraine. The Russians are probably at this stage the most capable military in the world when it comes to missile warfare and air defense. I, I think that really is almost indisputable at this stage. Uh, and uh, I think all of its allies, including Iran, probably have benefited in some way or another from their close uh, military relationship with Russia and Russia's expertise. Yeah. You know, I was surprised to learn that Iran had hypersonic missiles Nobody seems to be refuting that. And it's been rather well known and documented. The United States doesn't have them. And therefore, one can conclude that Israel doesn't have them. Oh, I think that's I clear. Also, that's clear. Yeah, and I, I also wondered, where did Iran get these? Did they develop these on their own, with their own science, their own technology, or maybe a little help from Russia? Um, all right. Did you want to say something on that? Uh, based on what I know, uh, uh, these these missiles, I mean, it's it's not entirely clear. These are closely guarded secrets, obviously, by the Russian Federation and military, uh, what the uh, maximum speeds are of its hypersonic missiles. I've read reports that they are as great as 9,000, 10,000 kilometers per hour. Uh, the reports that I've seen... Uh, relating to the apparently hypersonic missiles of uh, Iran are that they're not quite that fast. So I'm not sure that they're of the same caliber as uh, those of the Russian Federation. They have the most advanced hypersonic missiles. Um, it's entirely possible that Iran uh, did develop. I mean, they've been they've they've gone all in on missile technology. You know, they don't have anywhere near the military spending capacity that the United States and its major allies do. So they had to make some choices years ago as to how they were going to defend themselves. And they decided the primary way of doing that was to invest enormously in missile technology. It's possible they developed it on their own. I don't think the Russians would give away uh, their most valued uh, missile technology to anybody, frankly, however close they are. Uh, but uh, it is possible there has been some technological cooperation there, which has facilitated Iran's own development of hypersonic missile technology. Yeah. Uh, let's stick to uh, 
the massive missile attack on Israel. Um, Israel and the United States has said uh, it had very limited success uh, in terms of a military uh, perspective. However, you've pointed out that Iran learned a great deal about this Iron Dome, the missile defense system. The location of these missile, miss, missile defense systems and radar. And they also obviously learned a lot about how this ta attack progressed in three waves. But, mm -hmm. Dimitri, this has had to have a political and psychological downer, disaster for Israel, in my opinion. What are your thoughts? I couldn't agree more. I think disaster is the right way to describe it. Uh, another way you could describe it is an earthquake. Um, first of all, no one has ever launched an attack of this nature on Israel. There have been, Hezbollah has been waging missile warfare on Israel, but it has never brought to bear, ever. Uh, the caliber and quantity of missiles in a single attack against Israel that uh, Iran just did. Uh, and Iran struck the most protected targets. I mean, the, the Israelis are admitting, they're admitting that uh, missiles did strike the Nevatim air base. This is, I, I watched an interview yesterday, Scott Ritter, on uh, judging freedom about the missile attack. Of course, Scott has enormous expertise in these matters. And he said that the Nevatim air base in Israel is the most protected military asset on earth, even more protected than Washington. Um, and if Iran can strike the Nevatim air base with multiple, it wasn't just one, there were anywhere from five to 10 of these missiles. And I also understand that Iran didn't use any of its most sophisticated missiles yet. Um, you know, nobody's ever done this. Nobody's ever struck a military asset that that, that is that protected uh, uh, by Israel. Uh, and now uh, the Israelis all of a sudden are confronted with an entirely new reality. And the new reality, also the other thing to bear in mind, Regis, is that this is a tiny little fraction of Iran's missile arsenal. Remember, I, I, I said that for decades, Iran has prioritized the development of missiles both the quantity and the quality of its missiles uh, in its military industrial production. Uh, so uh, this is just an indication of what it can do. It's a very small indication, as a matter of fact. And now this little country, you know, if I've been to, I've been to Palestine uh, uh, five times. Uh, I've driven the length and breadth of the country. And coming from Canada, and you, I know you're in Russia, you, you probably would have a similar reaction if you've been there. Uh, what strikes you when you're traveling around is how tiny it is. It's so small, uh, both from north to south and particularly from east to west. Uh, that, that, that entire territory is now within striking range of Iran's missile uh, uh, forces. And uh, if I were an Israeli, um, I would be very, very concerned about this. And I'd be thinking very seriously about heading to the exit door frankly, because this country can no longer protect its citizens from uh, hostile forces in the region. And there's a lot of hostility towards Israel in the region, which has been accumulating over a period of decades. Uh, so, you know, there was an interesting tweet I saw uh, re uh, the other day from somebody whose uh, comments ex extensively on social media on the Ukraine war. He was quoting an official, I think it's the International Crisis Group, who's an Israeli, an Israeli analyst, who said that uh, apparently the statement that was attributed to him was that if Israelis knew what was being said by Mossad officials privately, four million of them would be rushing to Ben Gurion airport. Uh, in other words, essentially the entire Jewish Israeli population. Um, and uh, I think a lot of people in Israel right now are thinking about that. And you know, to sort of conclude my thought about this, going back to discussions that you and I had very early on in this genocidal war, when I talked about the looming strategic defeat for Israel, one of the predictions I made from the very outset, going all the way back to October, was that uh, if this continues to escalate, and there's every reason that it will, 
uh, what we're probably going to see at some stage is a mass uh, departure from Israel of its uh, Jewish citizens because they don't want to live. You know, they've been so indoctrinated uh, by the dehumanization of the Palestinians and decades of brutal occupation of Palestinian lands uh, that they don't believe that they can. I, I think this is wrong. I think it's terribly wrong, but I think they are absolutely convinced that they cannot coexist peacefully with Palestinians or with Arabs generally. Uh, I think they, they're, they're fanatically committed to that view. Uh, and if you believe that and you can't be disabused of that view, that very mistaken view, uh, and you suddenly wake up one day and you realize that your country's military can't protect you from uh, one of these hostile nations and its uh, allies in the region, uh, in this, this very small country, what are you going to do, especially if you have an option? And a lot of Jewish Israelis have an option. Uh, many of them have dual citizenship in a Western country. And those who don't could probably acquire it fairly easily if, because Western governments are so well uh, sort of disposed towards uh, Israelis and the country of Israel. Uh, so I think this is where we're heading. I stand by that prediction I made at the outset. And uh, I feel more certain than ever that what we're going to see is a democratic, a demographic uh, revolution in the months and years ahead in Israel. As more and more uh, Jewish Israelis, citizens of the country leave and fewer and fewer emigrate from Western countries to Israel. Yeah. Another thing that you uh, reported on on this show was how devastating the effect of this genocide inflicted on Palestine has been on the Israeli economy. I mean, everything from the attack of Hamas on October 7th to exchanges between the PLO and Hamas and then the Houthis blocking all traffic uh, to Israel. Uh, anyway... Yeah. This is more. Well, I just want to say, you know, even before this missile attack, missiles and drones launched by Iranian allies in the region were getting through. There was uh, an object, I think it was a warehouse, uh, that was struck in Elat, in the Red Sea port of Elat, probably by um, a drone that was fired by Ansar Allah in Yemen. And there have been repeated attacks on Haifa. Uh, by uh, Iranian allies in Iraq and Syria, and a number of those attacks seem to have had some neg had some damaging impact on infrastructure in Haifa. So uh, th this is just spiraling out of control for Israel, and I think it's in a world of trouble. Yeah, well, I, I agree with your assessment completely. Um, now, I, I want to talk about the effectiveness on of this attack, this barrage of missiles in terms of, again, demographics, but not within Israel, within the Middle East. What effect do you think this has had on countries like Egypt, Saudi Arabia, UAE, uh, Qatar, and others in that region who have been uh, st staunchly influenced by the United States of America and have been kind of tolerant and at ease with Israel. What do you think this will have on these countries in the region? This is an explosive situation for those countries. And I would say the number one hot zone uh, in the months and years ahead may well be Jordan, because Jordan uh, has continuously collaborated with the genocidal regime in Israel throughout this six months of genocide. It's collaborated in many ways, including by uh, it's, it's allowed its country to be used as a land bridge to Israel uh, in order to deliver uh, goods to the country that are necessary to sustain its population that would otherwise have transited through the Red Sea and that have been prevented from being transported to the uh, the Red Sea port of Israeli Lat uh, by means of uh, maritime transportation. So uh, in this particular attack, uh, it's it's been admitted by the Jordanians that they assisted in taking down a number of projectiles fired from Iran at Israel. And in fact, uh, there were photographs that emerged and videos that emerged 
on social media as the attack unfolded of the debris of missiles falling on Jordanian territory. Uh, there was one large chunk of a rocket that looked like some kind of a cruise missile uh, that fell in Amman, the capital itself. So effectively, the Jordanian autocrat, uh, a Western puppet by any rational measure, um, put his own people, uh, millions of whom are Palestinian, uh, at risk in order to defend a regime that's committing genocide against <laughs> Palestinians. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I was in Amman uh, three weeks ago and I went to a protest um, at, at the uh, Grand Husseini Mosque in Amman uh, in support of the Palestinian people. And by that point in time, this would have been mid-March, uh, by that point in time, there had been something like 12 consecutive protests uh, at this mosque, thousands of people coming out, uh, denouncing uh, the, the, auto the autocracy's uh, collaboration with the, uh, the Zionist regime. And, um, you know, in early February, a few weeks before I went there and witnessed this protest, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, on the same day, I think it was February 4th, put out reports condemning Jordan's repression of the protests. And they alleged that Jordan's uh, Jordanian authorities had had uh, arrested thousands of people, thousands of people who had uh, participated in these protests. And yet when I went there, the, I saw no indication that these people were going to back down. And they've continued and then they transited over to, they moved the protests from the Grand Husseini Mosque to the Israeli embassy in Amman. And there were some very, very tense protests taking place out there. I think there were something like 12 of them in a row. And I don't know whether they've continued up until the current time, but I I think the population in Jordan is enraged, absolutely enraged. And there was a poll in Saudi Arabia that was done three or four months ago, which showed that 96% of the Saudis wanted uh, the Saudi autocracy to sever all diplomatic relations with Israel. And the last thing I want to say about this, uh, uh, Regis, is that I was watching um, uh, the podcast of Andrei Martyanov uh, about two nights ago in which he commented upon the protest. And Andrei Martinov, for those of our listeners who don't know who he is, uh, he's of Russian origin. He lives in the United States. And he was a naval officer in the Soviet Navy and has uh, been commenting and writing about uh, military matters uh, and geopolitics for his entire life. I think he's about 60 now. Uh, an extraordinarily knowledgeable man. <laughs> Also very entertaining to watch, frankly. And he said something which struck me as uh, quite insightful. He said he thinks the biggest loser in uh, this missile attack uh, is Erdogan in Turkey. Because the Turkish government, and Erdogan in particular, have tried to position themselves as the champion of uh, Muslims uh, throughout the world, and particularly in West Asia, at least Sunni Muslims, uh, and what has Erdogan done during the past six months? He has uh, continued to allow his country to trade to the tune of billions of dollars with Israel's genocidal regime. All the while, you know, making fiery speeches, condemning Netanyahu, using the most inflammatory language, all of which was completely justified, by the way, but at the same time was actually taking no concrete action, military or economic at all in order to defend the Palestinian people, despite his enormous army, uh, by standard by the standards of just about any country, he has a gigantic army, did nothing at all to defend them. And he's been completely exposed. Uh, there was uh, an election in, in Turkey recently where uh, people were surprised at how badly Erdogan's party performed. And uh, there's good reason to believe that that was due in part to the public's anger inside Turkey itself with Erdogan's collaboration with the, the genocidal regime in Israel, you know, and a few days after the election, uh, Erdogan announced uh, trade restrictions with Israel for the first time after he took a beating in the elections. His party took a beating in these elections. And he even then he said, these will re remain in effect until there's a ceasefire. Not until the Palestinian people have a state, not until uh, Gaza is rebuilt, not until uh, Palestinians are given equal rights and their basic dignity is respected, just until uh, there's a ceasefire. That's as far as he was prepared to go. And I think the only reason why he did that was because uh, of the drubbing that his party took in the election. And then this, uh, this happens. Right now, Iran 
its standing in the Muslim and Arab world, I think, has gone up enormously. And this is going to have effects uh, on the distribution of power in the Arab and Muslim world uh, for years, if not decades to come. Yeah, good analysis. You know, another interesting point uh, is that it's been reported that Israel admitted they had spent something like $1.3 billion trying to defend themselves from this one assault. And by comparison, and the systems are very different where their defense and offensive capabilities come from, Iran sent a bunch of cheap drones, very inexpensive cruise missiles comparatively, and they do it all with a military industrial complex that is state owned and regulated, unlike the United States and where Israel is getting all of their stuff from. What are your thoughts on this economic uh, out of balance proportion between <laughs> Israel and Iran? I mean, to me, it says a lot of things. Iran is not hurting economically, but like Russia, they're using their resources much more wisely and under very strict control so as to avoid corruption and price overruns. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the number quoted, uh, the 1.3 billion, it's coming from the Israeli media. It was actually $1.35 billion. Uh, and that's just the money that was expended by Israel. Okay, Israel was also aided in this to a considerable degree by the air defense capabilities of the United States, Britain, France, and Jordan. So if you toss in the money uh, that they spent in defending Israel from this one attack, it could easily be in the range of two to three billion dollars, maybe even in excess of three billion dollars. The military budget of Israel in 2022 uh, was, I, I, the, I think the exact figure was 23.4 billion. That's the annual military budget, 23 to 24 billion dollars. What this means was that in a matter of hours, Iran caused Israel to expend the equivalent of almost 6% of its annual military budget on what was primarily by Israel's own admission, drones, cheap drones that cost ne next to nothing to build. And you're absolutely right, uh, Regis, that the structure of the military industrial complex in Iran and Russia, and also China, the three primary geopolitical uh, adversaries of the West, uh, is such that they are able to get a hell of a lot more bang for their buck because it's state-owned, overwhelmingly state-owned military industrial complex in Russia, in China, and in Iran. Iran uh, embarked upon a state-led, state-funded, state-controlled development of its military industrial complex all the way back in the 80s after the devastating war with Iraq, which was in which Saddam Hussein was aided, including uh, mm -hmm. with chemical weapons by Western governments, in particular the United States government, and killing hundreds of thousands of Iranians. So this caused them to think very, very hard about how they were going to use their limited economic resources, limited relative to the United States in particular, in order to defend themselves. Uh, in the West, meanwhile, uh, you know, these, these uh, military assets and particularly air defense systems are almost entirely, I mean, I'm not, I don't believe there's a single uh, state controlled uh, manufacturer or developer of missile technology and air defense systems in any Western country, including Israel. They are all for-profit corporations and they are gouging and have been gouging uh, the governments of the West and the taxpayers of the West with reckless impunity for decades. And it's just getting worse and worse. You know, the collective military budget of NATO before the current round of increases, now we're talking about a number that's much higher than the one I'm going to quote to you, was 1.2 trillion US dollars, okay? The combined military budgets uh, before the Ukraine war began were of Iran, China, and uh, and the Russian Federation were, were approximately in the roughly $400 billion, okay? So we are talking about one third, 
before the current round of enormous military spending increases in NATO countries. What has happened in uh, the South China Sea, you know, the theater of where there's tension, military tension between China and the West, uh, and in West Asia, where the primary object of Western uh, hegemonic efforts is Iran, and in Ukraine, where uh, the, you know, NATO has been pouring everything it's got, and plus the kitchen sink, into causing a military to defeat to the Ru Russian Federation. In every one of those theaters of conflict, the adversary of the West, despite spending vastly less money, um, is in a dominant position. Uh, Iran is now in a dominant position in West Asia. And the last thing I'll say about this is, you know, uh, for 20 years, 20 years, the entirety of NATO was brought to bear to defeat the Taliban in Af Afghanistan. And what happened? A An insurgent military force whose uh, members number, you know, uh, in the tens of thousands and who were armed with no more than light arms from the Soviet era, defeated the entirety of NATO over 20 years of warfare. The Americans and their Western vassals fled the country with their tails between their legs. And this despite the enormity of military spending in the West. You know, I, as a, as a taxpayer in a Western country, I am absolutely apoplectic about this. My money, my hard-earned money, is being squandered on these thieves because that's what they are, these military contractors in the West. They're out and out shameless thieves. And the people that are supposed to be representing our interests are aiding and abetting their theft on an epic scale. People in the West should be absolutely infuriated about this. And what are they doing? They're increasing the military spending. Uh, we got to put a stop to this before we're bankrupted uh, by the military industrial complex in the West because that's where this is heading. Yeah. Uh, all good points. Uh, before we move on, uh, the big question is, is there going to be a response? Israel said that this attack was a declaration of war. And all the articles I'm reading now are saying that Israel and the United States are contemplating a response uh, in in revenge, really, a tit for tat, eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I mean, this goes back thousands of years. Um, Dimitri, can Israel now, with what we've been discovering and what the rest of the world knows, do you think they will be stupid enough to attack Iran after what's just happened. What what are your thoughts on that? I have absolutely no doubt that they're stupid enough. In fact, I would be astonished, given the extreme violence and hubris and reckless, uh, right now, insane behavior of Israel and the United States, not just Israel, the United States government. We've seen the insanity of the U.S. government and its British poodle lapdog. Uh, you know, in Ukraine over the past two years, I would be absolutely astonished if there isn't a military response. However, uh, it, it, self destructive it may be, and it will be self destructive for Israel and for the West. The question that I think is a serious one, uh, and I don't know what the answer to this is, I have virtual certainty that there's going to be a military response. There shouldn't be. They should stop now before this spins out of control. Um, but what is the nature of that response going to be? So, for example, you know, the, the discussion around the potential responses seems to assume that uh, the choice confronting Israel and its Western backers is a binary one. So it's either do nothing or launch a direct attack on the physical territory of Iran, uh, which is something that at least Israel has not done explicitly. It may have done that through proxies, but up until now it hasn't done it explicitly. But there are a range of options in between those two extremes. They could go back to doing what they were doing in Syria, which was killing um, you know, uh, Iranian military personnel. They could be uh, orchestrating terrorist attacks on Iranian soil through proxies and then uh, you know, refrain from taking credit for them. So leaving... Uh, uncertainty in people's minds as to actually who was behind the terrorist attack. 
Uh, there's other options they could pursue short of a direct uh, and explicit attack on the physical territory of Iran. The problem that the Israelis have, however, is uh, the, are the public statements by Iranian officials since Sunday. There was an emergency meeting at the UN Security Council, and I listened to the entire speech of the Iranian representative, and over and over again, he said that there will be a huge response, a devastating response to any, he used the word any over and over again, any aggression, any provocation, any attack. And then the, I believe it's the prime minister or the president of Iran, today was quoted in the Western press, Raizi, as saying exactly that. He was even more explicit that uh, whatever form of uh, retaliation Israel employs will be met with a devastating response. So Israel doesn't at this stage, and I don't think the Iran Iranians are bluffing, you know, after what they just did, nobody should assume they're bluffing. Uh, the problem with Israel is that going back to business as usual, I don't think is an option any longer. And I don't know that these people are sane enough to actually understand this. If they go back to killing Iranian military personnel in Syria, they may quickly learn of the full force of Iran's destructive uh, missile capacity. Uh, I think that that should be assumed to be the response. You know, and since we're on this subject, it's something that has to be said because this is, you know, breaking news. Today, uh, UN appointed experts, uh, legal experts, issued a report. These were experts appointed by the United, United Nations Human Rights Council, Council that the attack, the destruction of the Iranian embassy or, or consulate in Damascus was a violation of international law. Uh, they don't seem to have any qualms about saying, I've been saying this from the day it happened. And so have other legal experts. This was an act of war and a flagrant violation of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. Uh, and um, Iran now has uh, a legal justification to respond. It always did, and frankly, given the level of aggression towards its country by Israel and uh, the United States and other U.S. proxies in West Asia. But now it has ample grounds to uh, strike back, and it has the ability to strike back, and it has seen, I think quite clearly, the weakness. Whatever they just decide to do, the Americans and the Israelis, the fact that they're hesitating and that they're uh, openly you know, debating with themselves and with each other whether or not there should be a response, and if so, what the response is going to be. All of this is communicating weakness uh, to Iran's government and to uh, other adversaries of Israel and the United States, both in West Asia and outside of West Asia. Um, so uh, the question that really, I think this is the real question that we all have to be very, very concerned about. And that is, if Israel chooses a an option lesser than a direct physical attack on Iran's territory, for which it takes credit, will Iran escalate? Uh, and to what degree? And I think the answer to that is likely to be yes. Yeah. You mentioned uh, a very powerful statements coming from Iran that if Israel does retaliate, they will inflict a devastating, devastating blow on Israel. Now, that means an all-out attack with everything they have. Now, it's very well And with known. probably Hezbollah's assistance. Hezbollah has not launched any large-scale attack on Israel yet. They're keep, they've kept back their best weapons, and they have probably at this stage in excess of 100,000 of them. So imagine a two, two a huge barrages of sophisticated missiles coming at Israel, both from South Lebanon and from Iran and from Iraq and from Syria and from Yemen. That's a very, very nasty scenario for Israel yeah, militarily. Yeah, and the only thing Israel has is what everybody knows they have is a nuclear response. Now, you and I have talked about that before, and you believe that they're perfectly crazy and capable uh, of using a nuclear weapon. But here's my question. Do you think that Iran might also have a nuclear weapon given the advanced technology that they've developed. Now, they've repeatedly said, we are not going to develop nuclear weapons. We want to develop only our nuclear capability to use electricity to power the country. What are your thoughts? Well, yesterday I interviewed uh, 
uh, Professor Mohamed Marandi of the University of Tehran. Uh, and you, this, his name may be familiar to you, and you can see the interview on my YouTube channel, Atremitri Lascaris 3051. Um, he may be familiar to our listeners because he is a frequent guest on Al Jazeera and has also been interviewed on CNN and Sky News and numerous other Western news organizations. And uh, his father was a former member of the Iranian parliament. I think he was the Minister of Health. Uh, Mohammed Morandi himself fought in the Iran-Iraq war and was wounded uh, more than once. Um, so this is a man who has a keen, intimate understanding of uh, the Iranian government and military and uh, how they're likely to have prepared the country for any eventuality. And he was adamant, I asked him this very question, he was adamant that Iran does not have a nuclear weapon uh, yes, it is a threshold country, as he pointed out, Japan is. It could develop a nuclear weapon very quickly, uh, but this is something that the government uh, does not feel uh, it is either appropriate or necessary for it to do because of its, because its uh, missile capacity and other Iranian, I'm sorry, other military uh, capabilities are a sufficient deterrent to Israel. So for th that was his view, and I, I'm in no position to question it. Uh, you know, without the benefit of of his insight, I would have said that there's a real uh, chance that since the Trump administration withdrew Iran from the nuclear era deal, uh, from I'm sorry, the Obama era nuclear deal with Iran, and did so even though the International Atomic Energy Agency certified at the time that Iran was complying with the deal, ever since then, Iran and you know has had a strong incentive with the belligerent language that was coming out of the Trump administration in Israel and the murder, the brazen murder of Iran senior general Qassam Soleimani at the Baghdad airport back in 2020, it's had a strong incentive to covertly develop a nuclear weapon. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm in no position to question the uh, insights of somebody like Mohammed Morandi, but um, I don't think we can exclude that possibility. And we especially should not exclude the possibility that Israel will use nukes. Uh, for what it's worth, again, uh, Professor Morandi was convinced, and he said this was the view of the Iranian government, that that's really not an option that is available to Israel in the real world. Practically speaking, uh, theoretically it is. But as a practical matter, uh, Israel's use of a nuclear weapon would be the final nail in the coffin of Israel's legitimacy in the eyes of virtually every government on earth. Uh, at that point, uh, even the United States would probably be compelled to abandon Israel. And without the full support of the United States economically, militarily, and political, politically, Israel, as it's currently constructed, is simply not a viable project. It cannot survive, uh, you know, in its current form. In other words, as, a, as an apartheid state. Uh, so um, will that ultimately deter uh, these lunatics, because that's what they are, from using a nuke in uh, a war against Iran and other adversaries that they are losing and losing badly? I don't know. I don't want to find out. None of us should want to find out. Um, and the only way ultimately to put a stop to all of this and eliminate that risk of happening, Regis, is when I've been saying this, and I'll say it again until I'm blue in the face, is we have to pressure Western governments into stop stopping the arming of Israel. This will all come to an end the oppression of the Palestinian people, the genocide in Gaza, the constant escalation uh, of conflict between Israel and Iran and its allies in the region, and the potential for nuclear war will all come to an end if the United States and other Western powers cut off the flow of weapons to Israel. Uh, thank you for that really brilliant analysis, Dimitri, as usual. Now, I want to totally shift gears, and uh, I want to talk very briefly before we conclude about Ukraine. The two are connected, if not by anything else other than the United States, supporting the military efforts in both places. Now, it's been reported that the Speaker of the House uh, is going to put up for a vote the sending of $60 billion, splitting it between Israel and Ukraine. Zelensky today 
just came out and blasted the United States and said publicly that the United States doesn't care about Ukraine. <laughs> Look what it's doing in Israel. It's protecting them. Uh, why, do, why doesn't the United States give us the same protection? Um, Dimitri, uh, my thought, initial thought on this is, look, he's been barking about this and biting the hand that's been feeding him for now several weeks, maybe longer. Uh, but now to come out, front page, top story news, in the Russian media anyway, uh, says the United States doesn't care about us and is treating and should treat us like it's treating Israel. You're shaking the, your head, but <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? Well, we just, you know, you and I could have told Zelensky this back in 2019 when he was running to be the president of Ukraine. I mean, what planet does this man live on? The United States never cared about Ukraine, ever. It has been absolutely crystal clear, and we've been saying this nonstop for years, that the United States government is using the Ukrainian people in the most cynical manner imaginable. They openly boast about the fact that they are using Ukrainian lives to weaken Russians' military, but that's what they purport to be doing, although I think they've done exactly the opposite. They've caused it to become stronger. But they openly boast about the fact senior officials in the Senate and in Congress and the Biden administration that it's the Iranians, the Ukrainians who are dying with American weapons and they're only expending a small fraction of their military budgets in order to enable this depraved, disgusting proxy war, which has destroyed the country. What planet does this man live on that he's only realizing this now? I know I, I was saying on social media months ago, before there was this big debate about this $60 billion in the U.S. Congress, this was back when the vaunted Ukrainian counteroffensive was happening last summer, and we didn't all know exactly how it was, that was going to turn out at that stage, that it's just a matter of time before the United States will throw Ukraine under the bus. And here we are, less than a year later, and that's precisely what the Americans are doing. This was entirely predictable. Uh, this man, if you ask me, he's a traitor. He's betrayed his country. He allowed his country to be used and destroyed in order to advance the United States' depraved hegemonic agenda. And the result uh, is one that the Ukrainian people will have to live with for the rest of their lives. I cannot imagine that this country is going to be able to recover to what it was prior to this war within my own lifetime. And, and with each passing day, Regis, the destruction and the death and the disablement of Ukrainians, and now they're talking about forcing young men, you know, as young as 25 into this military when it's collapsing on the ground and doesn't have sufficient weaponry. And, and the other thing that's the, the cruel and sort of irony about this, I mean, really, I, none of this is entertaining at the end of the day. I, I laugh at Zelensky's sheer incompetence, but I'm horrified for what's happened to the people of Ukraine and outraged with my government, the Canadian government, for having participated in this depravity. Um, but he was out there running around saying, you know, for two years since the Ukraine war began, that he wanted Ukraine to become a big Israel. That's what he said. He wanted Ukraine to become a big Israel, a big apartheid fascist state, effectively, because that's what Israel was at the time. And it's more so those things now than it ever was. And uh, here you have the, the cruel irony is that the United States, rather than give whatever weaponry it has left, uh, is giving it all to Israel. And uh, is basically saying, we got nothing left for you, nothing. Uh, this, this missile attack, by the way, again, it's almost, it's almost uh, there's all, seems almost like a divine hand at work behind all of this. You know, just days before this missile attack by Iran, Zelensky said uh, that he wanted, I think, 25 Patriot missile brigades. You know, so this was in the range of 150 to 200 Patriot batteries. That's what he was asking for, which is substantially more than all of the Patriot batteries in the entire United States Army. This is what he was saying. You think they're going to be sending any Patriot missiles to Zelensky now? After Ukraine, I mean, if they had any to give, after Iran launched this attack and showed that it can penetrate the most heavily defended military installations in Israel, it's all over. 
It's over for Zelensky. It's over for the Ukrainian military. It's over for his coup regime. And the sooner that man is removed from power, replaced by somebody who can actually deal with the realities of this world, the better it will be for the Ukrainian people. Uh, this truly uh, a tragedy of unspeakable proportions, what's happened to them. And I think the division of this, you know, this, this military uh, spending legislation into an Israeli component and uh, a Ukrainian component, uh, the writing's on the wall there. The reason why the Speaker of the House, the Republic Speaker of the House is doing this is because he really wants to give more money to Israel, but he doesn't want to give any more money to Ukraine. That's why they're separating these two spending initiatives. Now is the time to negotiate a surrender as quickly as possible. And if Zelensky doesn't do that, I don't think there's going to be any Ukraine left for anybody to lead in the months and years ahead. Yeah, that's a good analysis. Um, by the way, I, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's new legislation that they're going to draft 16-year-olds up to 50-year-olds. And included in that legislation is a clause that is saying they are not going to allow, uh, as previously was under law, uh, troops to return home after three years on the front. And so the result of this has been more and more of the population are turning against him. His popularity in, in Ukraine now is falling like a rock. And... I'll say this about Zelensky. <clears throat> Adding to your comment, he is completely delusional. He's not a very smart man. He's supposed to be a lawyer, but he's a comedian. But he has no understanding of recent history about what the United States has done to all the others who they are who who they use, just like they're using him. I mean, you go to Saddam Hussein. You can you can go to Gaddafi. I mean, you just all the people that the United States has used and then thrown under the bus, as you've said. The other thing that he has no understanding about whatsoever is any military history. He he, I mean, he he's got this messianic belief, I think, about himself. And Dimitri, I just can't understand how he hasn't already been removed in a military coup. What are your thoughts on this before we conclude? You know, they they withdrew, the United States withdrew from Afghanistan, I believe it was October of 2021, if I'm not mistaken. It was like three or four months before, uh, you know, uh, the war began, the special military operation began in Ukraine. And uh, what happened when the United States withdrew? The brutal, corrupt proxy government fell within a matter of days. The one that had been propped up at great expense to American taxpayers for some 20 years. Uh, and you'd think that if you actually had a brain, a functioning brain, and you're the leader of Ukraine, you would say to yourself, hmm, that doesn't look like a real, reliable ally to me. Uh, they're telling me, you know, uh, and remember, that there were negotiations, uh, it's now widely reported and acknowledged, even in the West, that there were negotiations in the first two months of the uh, Ukraine war, which almost led to a peace deal, which didn't require uh, Ukraine to give up uh, any part of the Donbass or Luhansk or Kherson region or uh, Zaporozhye region. It just required Ukraine uh, to uh, stay out of NATO and uh, there was more or less a recognition, as I understand this peace deal, that Crimea, which for 200 years was part of the same country as Russia and is effectively Russian in every meaningful sense of the word, would have to be given up. Uh, now that's a peace deal that's not available to this man. Uh, it's not available. It's not going to be available to any Ukrainian leader. I wrote a piece, uh, you know, three months when when I was getting vilified by including by people who had formerly been politically allied with me back in 2022 for criticizing Western government policy towards this war. I wrote a piece called uh, that, you know, the Trichillian Zelensky is a, uh, a Western fiction. And in it, I noted, just as you did, uh, Regis, that this man was spectacularly unqualified for this job. Yeah, he went to law school. He never practiced law for a single day. He spent his entire adult life doing comedy. 
He had no economic expertise, no military experience or expertise. He had no uh, understanding of or experience in diplomacy and government administration. He was, and, and this is no insult to comedians. Comedians are, you know, that make a great contribution to our culture and our societies. But this man was not qualified to do that job. And now he's suspended elections in Ukraine, you know, whereas the Russian Federation during a time of war had an election recently. Uh, Zelensky has said, well, we can't have one. Why? Well, you can't have one because you know that you're going to lose. Uh, so at this stage, the only way to save Ukraine, frankly, is uh, for that man to be removed by power from power and uh, for him to be replaced by somebody, as I said, who is in touch with reality. That's the best thing that could happen to the people of Ukraine at this stage. Dimitri, I have to thank you once again for another really informative uh, hour and a couple of minutes. Uh, I can't thank you enough. Take care. Yeah. Uh, good to, good health to you. And uh, we'll, we'll do this again real soon. Look forward to it. 